All right, so kind of give me the history of of your background. You have a yeah. music background in mm. college and stuff like that. Kind well, of walk me through that. My history is is a church history. Um, I come from a long line of pastors, and and while your, da your dad's a pastor, my grandparents and okay. uncles are okay. pastors, and my mother, as part of that family, she didn't go into the ministry. But what was funny was I don't know. My dad grew up Catholic. Hmm. My mom grew up Assemblies of God. Okay. So you know, so naturally we were Southern Baptists. <laughs> but we were, so. But in that, somehow she wrote dad into teaching children's church. And I was five years old when they started. We lived in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, they started in, in the basement of a little church and they started teaching children's church. I don't know what the size of the church was. I don't know how many kids they started with, but those were that was in the days of bus ministry. Okay. And so... Bus ministry, if you don't know what that is, that, that is a, that is a thankless job yeah. that pays nothing back to the church at all. Yeah. Where they would take old school buses and they would just drive them through neighborhoods and, pick, pick and whatever kid wanted to get on the bus would get on. The How bus. would that be allowed? Right in the, yeah. In the age of, of, of printed check-in sheets and thumb, you know, thumbprints and stuff, you, you would just pick kids up off of the, off the side of the street and bring them to church. And um, and so I remember there being over a hundred kids in this little church basement every mm -hmm. week. And my dad would do anything from dress up in a bird costume and tell a story, mm -hmm. or uh, I remember him dressing up in a basketball warm up suit and coming in and doing dribbling basketball tricks and stuff mm -hmm. like that. My mom would play the piano and we would sing songs, and that's how it went. They they did that for so many years, and I remember them saying, "We're we're not going to teach children's church anymore." And they had a big party for him. Thank you for your service, you know. Yeah. And there and the Miliuses are done with children's church. They were in service the next week, and somebody came and tapped him on the shoulder and said, "Could you all go downstairs because there's nobody down there working?" You mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And they were right back downstairs. To where eventually we left the church because they couldn't stop teaching children's church right wow. we moved to texas same thing happened they got okay. right back into children's church they taught children's church at a church in east texas for a, a good 15 20 years all in all they taught children's church for about 25 or 30 years so you followed right in their footsteps. so i so i started in that and i grew up and they made us do puppets and we built a puppet stage. We, they made us, uh, you know, we had our, our drums and our whatever. And it was just children's church all day, every day in our house. It you was know, never puppet, a job. Puppets but it was, are kind of a theme of Jim Weidman. Jim mm -hmm. uh, Weidman. Megan. And I talked with uh, Yancey about that the yeah. other day. That, like, uh, yeah, just kind of puppets, puppets are, are yeah. I did puppets back in the day. It's, and, and of course, uh, Veggie Tales started as puppets too. They were puppets yeah. before they were, they were anime characters. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, the puppet thing is weird. Now, for my generation, it was, um, it was the Muppets. And so we yeah. were watching the Muppets. Yeah. So I didn't even think of puppets as a church thing. Right. I thought of puppets as a, well, the right. Muppets are and on all TV. That. Sesame Street. I watched Jim Sesame Street. Yeah, all I, Jim Henson stuff. Yeah, I watched Sesame Street. I watched the Muppets. We're going to do them in church. To right. me, it just seemed like, well, that's, that's a way that you entertain people, you know? Right. But yeah, they would, I remember they put us in a car. We drove to Dallas. We went to some apartment and this guy just had floor to ceiling puppets and he had all sizes, all kinds. And you could buy scripts from this guy. Was you that could, a little creepy? It was super creepy of... <laughs> if you're in the seventh grade. And then, uh, but yeah, we would go home, but that's, that's how we learned. I mean, yeah. puppets are how we learned how a sound system is hooked up. Yeah. It's how we learned audio stuff. It's how we yeah. learned how mics work. It's, you know, everything. So that puppet thing is, it's a, it's a weird common denominator. So you were, you, did you go right into ministry and then on the you know, church? I days? did. I, um, especially being in a small town in East Texas, I couldn't wait for college to start. And I had to stay local for a couple of years. I wanted to come up here to Nashville to go to school. I started local for a couple of years, but by that time I knew everybody around and it was as natural as any, just like you went to the grocery store to get a job bag and groceries. You went to a little church to become a youth pastor. Hmm. And so it wasn't, it wasn't long at all before, um, I, I was a youth pastor in a little church. And of course, with that, you become the worship leader in a little mm -hmm. church, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. 
And so, as in fact, what was funny about it is I got my first church when I was 18 years old. And I remember thinking, my, my favorite part going into it was I'm going to get to schedule trips to Six Flags. And I'm going to get paid to schedule trips to a water park. And I gave my first Bible study. And I said, I want to do this the rest of my life. Hmm. And so I, I started teaching the, the class and, and we had our Wednesday nights and we had our you know little Sunday evening thing. And I loved every part of being a youth pastor. Mm. That was fun, especially as a 18, 19, 20 year old. You get about 30 and it gets a little old. Yeah, <laughs> right. in all honesty. But, but when, yeah. you're, when you're young, it was fantastic. And so I, I was at a few, you know, would you know, go from one church to another, or increase in size a little yeah. bit, but school was suffering. So, it, so when, it, when the opportunity to come to Nashville and to go to Belmont opened up, I said, I've got to go finish school. If I stay mm. here, I'm, it'll just be these churches for the rest of my mm -hmm. life, which was fine, but you know. So you did school go at Belmont, and then you went on to serve I, additional. Yeah, church I got staffs? to Belmont, and uh, and 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 that was a great time of playing in um you know played in ensembles. I was a keyboard player, played in ensembles, and that led to working at a church in south of Nashville, a little non-denominational church south of Nashville. That church was um. It, I, I don't think they ever had more than 200 people in that church on a given week, but it was in Brentwood and Barbara Mandrell and her family went to church there, country singers. Yeah. Um, Glenn Campbell was there for a little while. Um, what, I'm, I'm drawing, Tony Brown, the producer, was there for a little while. Um, so many singers and songwriters, so much country music that came through there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we even had uh, we, uh, one day Russ Limbaugh came and visited, mm. and and that was the only day that the church lost their minds. It, you could have you could have any you <laughs> like could have any celebrity. country celebrity come through there, you know. But yeah. Rush Limbaugh came in, and it yeah. was just a mob, you yeah. know. And and that was in the mid. So you mainly really served really as worship leader. I was the worship leader and the youth pastor. Went on to just be the worship leader. Okay, um, left there. Served in a church for a little while, but then eventually, um, as a volunteer, served in a church okay. as a volunteer. And and oddly enough, that's where Children's Choir started. Okay. So after, you know, after a few years of, of youth ministry and, uh, and some worship leading, um, we were s serving... Uh, as volunteers at Christ Community Church in Franklin and and one Christmas program, the couple that was leading it said, um, we're, we're done with this now. And if anybody feels called to do this, you know, <laughs> feel free to come up. And and I honestly, it, it felt like a little calling. I said, mm. you know, I think we're supposed to go do this mm. and um, and did it. And um, and I saw something I'd never thought of children's choir. I don't think I was ever even in a children's choir. Mm. You know, now we did a lot of youth choir. In my youth group growing up, I grew up in the time of the big Stephen V. Taylor musicals and mm -hmm. Friends mm -hmm. Forever and things like that in the 80s and 90s. And, mm -hmm. and those were big, those were big times, but I don't think I'd ever done children's choir before. But at Christ Community, we did, we would take the kids up and sing during service some. And, and the, the first word that I thought, the first time I watched them standing in the back is I said, this is magical. This mm -hmm. is absolutely magical. The energy, the connection between the parents to what's happening on the stage mm -hmm. and how everybody's just rooting for it yeah. to, yeah. to win. And so I said, I said, this, there's something to this. There's, mm -hmm. there's something there. Um, uh, and so, where, so did, where did CM Worship come in yeah. the mix here? So, uh, so it wasn't too long after that. Where yeah, I'm sorry, I'm giving you the whole life no, story, but um, but doing that, I was um, I found my way over to World Outreach in Murfreesboro, yeah. and um, and was just filling in as a piano player here and there. And one week, the pastor's wife was waiting for me out in the lobby. And she said, "I heard that you're doing children's choir." In Franklin, I said, "Yeah, as a volunteer." She said, "How's that working?" And I said, "It's great." And she said, "We want that here, mm -hmm. but we can't make it work. We've tried, and we can't make it work." And I said, "Well, I would love nothing more than to, than to see how you know, see what we could do here." So went on a staff in 2003 at World Outreach to start a kids choir that they weren't sure they even wanted because mm -hmm. they weren't sure it was going to work. So I was playing the piano, working in the worship team, and. Um, we had our first week of kids choir. They said, you know, we want some kids to sing a couple songs at a Christmas program. Um, let's have let, let's have a night of kids choir at six o'clock on Sunday. And and um, and we opened the door and 120 kids walked in the door wow. first night. 
and and from there that was that was 2003 um we had 120 kids by the time i was done at world outreach in 2019 we had um 120 second through sixth graders we had 104 four five six year olds we wow. had over 100 teenagers in a youth choir and over 100 volunteers wow. in the church it was a wow. wonderful program that the church got behind 100 yeah. percent and the lessons that we learned at World Outreach, growing those yeah. was the catalyst for what CM Worship became. Okay, so yeah, bring bring me to that. When did CM Worship start? So in 2019, um, we realized that we had a catalog of material that the Kids Choir at World Outreach had done. This is original music or is this Some of it was original, a lot of it's arrangements. Okay. You know, um, we were fortunate at World Outreach to do original Christmas programs, maybe even an original spring program with our choir, but they also would sing with the worship team. And so we would do whatever worship song or maybe something big off the charts or Mm -hmm. something like that and do a production once in the fall, once in the spring. And so we had this catalog of arrangements for kids choirs and because of the the focus that world outreach has there were churches that would maybe they would do one of our musicals the next year maybe we would do a musical that word or brentwood benson had made and they would ask to rent costumes or you know or 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 material from those musicals and so it developed a little network of churches and over time i started feeling a burden of how can we equip these churches and and mainly you, with musical yeah we, with material for, mu- for yeah, musicals. yeah with material but also with training i mean we we took the world outreach kids to the first kids matter conference and when was that 2015 or 2016 and mm-hmm. we premiered a musical for brentwood benson and we did a little class of how to start a kids choir i thought we would go in there and give some rehearsal tips and all and it was a room full of people who really wanted a kids choir but had no idea how to get started okay. and that's the type of thing i really believe in uh, um i having not just saying we have the arts in the church but really letting the church be a safe place where kids can grow their talents and their giftings mm-hmm. in that area um, is important. And it, it made a difference at World Outreach. And so we wanted to share those techniques and those those principles with other churches okay. and realize that this was that at that point, it was a good stepping off point to take what we had learned and take it out so the so the thrust of cm worship is is musical so c is cm children's, children's ministry, ministry worship okay the original thrust was going to be how can we equip kids choirs how can we equip children's choirs with both musicals and uh material right okay um but we started it in 2020 right before covid and so as we're putting this material right. together, no one's meeting to do. Not things. only is no one meeting, but kids choirs are falling apart. Right. You know, no, what, what you definitely can't have is a kids choir. Right. And so, uh, so kids choirs fell apart. Nobody needed that. But what was interesting in the network of, of children's choirs that, um, that we were talking to at the time was that they were children's choirs were being asked by churches during COVID to step in and lead worship because they couldn't get adults there. Maybe they were doing things over video. Mm -hmm. And the children's ministry said, can you bring the the kids choir kids in? And and from a children's ministry perspective, this might sound weird, but knowing that in most churches that had kids choirs, they're housed in the worship area. And so, so, they are more centered. They said, well, we're more geared towards doing a musical. We're not really geared. We don't lead worship, which sounds strange, mm-hmm. but they didn't. So they said, we're we're used to putting on a Christmas program. We're used to doing a choir special. We don't have any kids that can lead worship. And so once they started asking for resources, here we are, this new company that is just building up resources to sell. We put the musicals off to the side and we said, well, we've got a bunch of worship songs. And so we just started cranking out worship songs as quickly as mm-hmm. we could mm-hmm. and giving them to these children's choir leaders who could take them into children's church and have their kids learn these worship songs. Okay, so Through they're that, using musicals and, and now popular worship right. songs. Right, and, 
and through that we started meeting these children's pastors which that okay. wasn't that was a network we really didn't know before so we started meeting these children's pastors and really developed a heart of ministry towards them all of a sudden it became a ministry what we started as a business started becoming a calling of these children's pastors are looking for resources that can engage their maybe even their middle schoolers to come back and be leaders mm -hmm. to lead that can give them resources to have worship programs that are beyond just this is connected to our curriculum you know Mm -hmm. Is this this is full time? This is what you guys yeah, this is what we do, do. all the time. Yes. Uh, and so, tell me why. Let's kind of get into some visuals. So, why do you guys use a lot of video content? You use a lot of motion graphics videos, lyric videos. Uh, why do you choose to use that? Why is visuals important to to what you guys do? Yeah, great question. Um, I'm a musician. And so the first thing you think of is, well, let's put some songs together. Or the first thing a musician would think of is let's put some songs together. But what we learned in kids choir from a, from a kids choir background is that you have a lot of kids who come in. These are their theater families. They're performing families. This guy sings great. This kid can act. These girls are dancers, you know, and they're all the, their parents are taking them to dance lessons or they're auditioning for community theater. Um, that may be out of a group of 100, that may be 20 kids, but it's definitely not all 100 of them. And if I'm just, and I, I want to, any, any kids choir director, the challenge is, how do I develop those kids and give them the best experience and help them to be the best that they can be, while at the same time welcoming in all these people that they can't sing, they don't care to sing, but they want to share their testimony, they want to serve in their church, right. so they want to be in choir. But we're not musical, you know? Um, kids choirs are great at that because they allow you to get on stage and you don't have to be musical, especially if you're doing hand motions, you're doing some choreography, you're in mm -hmm. a group, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so now it can include everybody, not just the right now. Everybody's theater. In, right uh, now, everybody's included. You have a place where the theater uh, arts people can thrive, but it's welcoming to everybody. Right. Mm -hmm. And part of the way that you're able to train all that is you're able to train them to do. I can't sing, but I can do hand motions. Mm -hmm. And how do you learn to do hand motions or how do you even lead hand motions? Well, you put them on a video and you have someone on the video that is instructing them to do it, whether you're, whether it's kids choir or worship, you're putting someone on the screen and that could be in the worship service itself. Maybe you don't have a group of leaders that can, you know, maybe you don't have access to teens in the youth group to come into your children's ministry, but you have, you have this video. And if, right. and if the video is welcoming and, uh, and, 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 um, uh, engaging enough, mm -hmm. well, then all of a sudden now I've got a leader that I can watch do do these hand motions. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, if you're fortunate enough where you do have some teen leaders and you do have a, a group of people, that video also becomes a training tool right. that they can use during the week that everybody comes in on the same page. One of the things that we're real big on with not burning out volunteers and keeping people, keeping the momentum going of the people serving in churches, you don't want to have to keep making trips to church all week for multiple right. practices and right. all. But if you can put a video online, if it can right. go on planning center, if it can go, you know, on your church's website or something like that, well, now all of a sudden everybody comes in prepared and everybody's on the same page. One thing I love about you guys is the quality of the video content. <clears throat> We've been in the space a while, me and you, and can can see the difference between low quality and high quality stuff. And you guys really value that. You can tell by the, the stuff that you put out. Thanks. So why, why do you spend the money, time, resources to make sure that that video quality is, is high? You know, you, anybody would like to think that, that whether it's church or school and educational process or something, people would like to think that that we're making we're we're taking in information intellectually that we're we're getting facts and figures we're processing them rationally church is really big on that that we we would love to think that we're all walking in sitting down opening up our bibles we're being fed 
the outline. We're taking that outline in and, um, and, and we're all going home lesson learned, ready to apply that to our lives. And I love preaching as much as anybody. I love good preachers and I love listening to them. But the reality is, is that we're taking in and retaining things emotionally. And there's, there are things that happen in church, whether it's, whether it's even just my experience in the parking lot, getting to the building, Mm-hmm. or my experience walking through the lobby or checking my kid into children's church. There's experiences that happen all along the way that prepare us, that put us in a mindset or set a tone for when that preaching and when the word's being shared, how, how are we prepared for that? And, and whether it's a color palette or whether it's a, a design, those things make an impact. And what we sit and see visually is just as much of a message as the style of music that we play in worship, or whether we have theater seats or pews, or whether the pastor's wearing a suit or a polo shirt. All those things make a difference. Mm -hmm. And what we want for churches specifically in these children's areas is we want to be, and I know this is where you guys are too, I see this in everything you guys put out. What you want is the church, the, the children's pastor, the people on staff, they're, they're, they're in a people business. Yes. But they want to show that they're giving those people the best. And companies like y'all's, pe- companies like CM Worship, we can we can do that production work for you. You need to focus on the people. Correct. But we want to give you something that makes your look consistent, that makes it look branded, that makes it look cohesive. We don't want, we don't want anything. We want to help you uh, not look like you threw something together. Can kids tell the difference in that? Does it matter to kids, kids, the quality level of visuals? Can kids explain the difference in that? Probably not. Can the adults explain the difference in that? Probably not. But do do they perceive the difference in that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, how how is worship affected? And you know, just using our 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 resources, how is worship affected when you can have a worship set of three songs that have a cohesive look, a cohesive feel, can bounce one song to the other? It's going to sound the same. It's going to feel the same. Or Compared to I'm pulling up a YouTube and watching three ads and waiting for the skip now button to show up and who knows what ad is coming up on YouTube and now this, you know, and, and who knows what, am I playing a concert video? Am I playing a produced video? Um, that cohesive look matters. Um, we had a choir volunteer that was, that was helpful in production, uh, years ago and he used to say they're moved and they don't know why. Yeah, they're moved and they don't know why. Yeah, and that 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 sits in the back of my mind with everything we do. Yeah, I think that's such a good point. I, I that they might not be able to explain it, but they definitely see it when they see it. Yeah, uh, and I think that you guys do such a great job of that, and it's so consistent. Um, do you think that? Do you think that the that the visuals really do matter, or how we present the gospel is there's a correlation between how they receive it? Hundred percent. Is it? Um, you'll know this better than I do. Is it? Um, is it James Gunn who color maps his movies before he writes the script? I don't. Know, I heard somebody. Yeah. Mm. I heard. I heard whether it's him or somebody that they 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 map out the color scheme of the scenes mm. to define the arc of the story mm. before they write out the script. Mm-hmm. And um, I I don't. I think in this day and age, well, as our as our pastor at World Outreach used to say to the children's department, you're not competing with the church down the road. You're competing with Disney Channel mm-hmm. and you're competing with, well, you're not competing with the church down the road. You're competing with Disney Plus mm-hmm. and you're competing with Netflix and you're, comp- you're competing with shows on that. Mm-hmm. And I promise you those multi-million dollar budget shows aren't just going for a nicer puppet or... Mm-hmm. Or something. They're going for better animation. Mm-hmm. They're going, and that better animation is coming across in a 
better conceived color palette, a better conceived yeah. design. So should the church spend more money on our media content, visual visual content, staff members, resources? I think the church should spend the church should spend money and time on anything that enhances the presentation of the gospel. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. So last question for you. Um what is some of the um what is some of the greatest impact that you've seen through not only your music, but maybe some of the visual content that you've, that you've put out? Why does it that, matter? That we've put out. I, you know, the reason why it's important to have professional people, and that's not to knock the guy that's slaving away, you know, right. doing something for, for a church because that, there's, there's a ministry there. The value that you get in having professional people put something together is there is a fine line in music, in visuals, in anything creative. There's that fine line of is it is it is it good enough to stay out of the way? Is it is it just good enough to be noticed and then forgotten? Hmm. And and if it becomes in anything, if it's the visuals or if it's the music. If it becomes the passion project of the guy creating it, and all of a sudden it becomes the focus, then it gets in the way. Mm. But if it's quality, if it's something that that raises the standard of excellence for the worship leader and for the and for the pastor when he gets up to preach, if it's something that sets him up for a win, then then it should absolutely be used in the service. Mm. Lyric videos are big about that. Yes. How can I make my lyric video? You know, one of the things that the, one of the biggest challenges that we face when we make a, a lyric video is how can we make it interesting enough, but not feel like we have to reinvent the wheel with every video because we don't need the video to be the focus. Right. You know, the, the video's there to see the words, to have some energy, and get right back to the person leading. Mm -hmm. It's a tool. It's yeah. an instrument. It's yeah. a tool. Well, man, thank you so much for your ah, time, Keith. Thank you for man, that. Thanks for doing this. Yep. You guys are great. This is going to work because people need to know this. This is the kind of thing that it it comes across as people want to say it's superfluous. Yeah. But this is what this is where the line is drawn between how is my message communicated effectively? Yeah. And and how is and how is it a, a and how does it well between being inconsistent and consistent? Yeah. So thank you guys. Yeah, thanks. This has been a podcast presentation of Church Visuals, executive produced by Carl Barnhill, edited by A.J. Schubert, title and show graphics by Angie Lomas. For more resources to help you visually communicate the gospel in your kids' ministry, visit churchvisuals.com.